Um, good afternoon. Uh, of course, the Green Paper is, is non-binding, it's not legislation. But for, for Greenpeace, as it is for the Irish presidency, as it is for uh, Shell, it is a key, a key issue. And why is that actually? Because the Green Paper will start a design process uh, for a new round, a new wave of legislation for 2030. So these policies will, will shape the investment decisions for decades to come, and they will determine uh, whether a transition towards a green economy will be successful. Uh, and it will also determine whether Europe will play a meaningful role uh, towards the international negotiations uh, with, uh, as the most important uh, element, the COP uh, in 2015 in Paris. Because Europe must have its house in order in order to convince others to come on board. So it's quite crucial that we get these 2030 policies right. Um, one of the main design issues for the 2030 climate and energy policy framework um, is the one of coherent targets and an integration of the policy architecture. And I would like to elaborate a bit on this and then also touch on the issue, very important issue of competitiveness. So Greenpeace, and that's together with, with energy companies, of course other NGOs, uh, but also companies like Philips, uh, Axo Nobel, have all spoken out for an approach with a trio of targets. And there are actually three main arguments uh, for not only having a greenhouse gas target only or an emissions trading approach uh, only, but also having a dedicated renewable energy and a dedicated energy savings target in place for 2030. Um, first, firstly, renewable energy and energy savings have been uh, recognized uh, by the European Commission as, uh, and also by the EU government as so-called no regrets options. So that means that under any type of decarbonization scenario, you would need to have investments in energy savings and renewables anyway. Even if politicians would decide to focus more on nuclear energy or on carbon capture and storage, uh, re renewables are necessary to provide enough electricity and heat to European citizens. So that means that in any case, we need a good investment climate for these options. And that brings me to my second argument. Renewable energy targets and energy saving targets will actually reduce the future costs of emission reductions. Let's first, for example, look at, at renewables. Here you can see on this, on this uh, slide uh, from Bloomberg New Energy Finance, uh, energy finance that um, there were already massive uh, cost reductions over the last years in the cost of renewables. And that's, of course, largely due to R&D, but also thanks to large-scale deployment of renewable energy. And uh, types of renewable energy are actually cheaper than, than nuclear nowadays. Um, and, of course, investments can be triggered by a carbon market, by market pool, but they can never replace the clarity of fixed uh, renewable energy deployment targets for 2020, but it should also be there for 2030. Uh, the ATS is a good mechanism. That's, I would not like to dispute that. It rewards investments in technologies that are mature and cost-efficient in the very short term. But the ATS won't help investments in technologies that are currently still under development, that are still immature. This is a slide that I stole from the Oco Institute. Uh, this is an abatement cost curve. So you can see here the abatement potential in terms of emissions and here the cost. Uh, Renewables are more here. They have maybe right now higher costs, but in the medium term, you will need them. Um, so you need dedicated policies to have also investments, R&D investment, deployment investments in these technologies. The ETF price will only work properly for these options in the middle. And for energy savings, it's actually even more uh, obvious because a lot of the efficiency measures already have negative costs and are actually on the left side of the abatement uh, curve but they are locked in. Companies, individuals are not investing in energy savings because, for example, there are capital barriers or there are knowledge barriers. So you need specific regulations as well to unlock this very uh, low cost or even cost negative uh, potential. So without an energy savings target, Europe will simply pay too much for its climate action. And that would be a shame, especially in these more difficult economic times. Um, thirdly, Dedicated targets for renewable energy and energy savings will help to align the 2030 policies with other EU policy objectives, not only the environmental ones, but also uh, resource efficiency, job creation, energy security, lowering the healthcare costs. 
Europe is today spending over 1 billion euro a day on importing fossil fuels, and that's leading to a major energy trade deficit. Uh, for example, uh, the example is Ireland, of course, you've spent over uh, 6 billion euros on fossil fuel imports in 2011, and renewables have helped in Ireland. Uh, in 2011, 300 million euros uh, you saved by replacing natural gas imports with uh, renewable energy uh, production. That's a great achievement, and, and Ireland is therefore also in, in a key position to take the lead uh, in Europe, both in the political debate and, term, and in terms of investments. Another example, healthcare costs. Uh, coal plants in Europe cost us today 43 billion every year in terms of lung diseases, heart diseases, lost working days, and specific policies encouraging renewables will help to cut these, these bills, and that's, that's absolutely crucial. Um, then I come to the issue of competitiveness, uh, because, of course, another reason to look at 2030 renewable energy, energy savings, greenhouse gas targets is the issue of competitiveness. Uh, and, of course, it's, it's right now very important, but I'm, I'm concerned that so far the debate is too much um, narrowing down on the issue of electricity prices. And competitiveness is actually broader than that. It's also about a good investment climate for innovation, uh, education level of the workforce, tax policies. Um, importantly, uh, the renewable energy policies that Europe had so far have helped to bring to Europe a first mover advantage. Globally, two thirds of the investments in renewable energy are done by European companies. And in the EU, there are over one million people working in the renewable energy sector. But of course, Chinese, South Korean, American companies want to take over that leading role. But if we want to keep European companies to stay in the lead, uh, we need to put in place a 2030 framework with a specific renewables target, with a specific greenhouse gas target, and a specific energy savings target. Secondly, competitiveness is not only about the price of electricity, but it's also about how efficient industries are actually operating. Uh, because more efficient industries will be, of course, less uh, vulnerable, will be more resilient to fluctuating and high fossil fuel prices. Uh, and under any scenario, as also Jakub mentioned, uh, energy prices will uh, go up, and it's uh, whether we take climate action or not, prices will go up, and so it's better if industries prepare themselves for that and become resilient to this uh, uh, fluctuating and increasingly high prices of coal, gas, and oil. Um, then I would also like to touch on, on an issue uh, that is more complex, but so far not really highlighted in the debate around competitiveness. Uh, and I can best explain that with an example of the, of the steel industry. You can see here on the X axis, you can see GDP per capita of countries. And here on the Y axis, you can see um, steel uh, consumption per unit of GDP. So how much steel do you need to produce uh, one euro of, of GDP? And um, what you can see in this graph is that while well, China, Brazil, and India are, are, of course, rapidly growing emerging economies, here on the left side, their, their steel consumption per unit of GDP is rapidly growing because they need a lot of investments in infrastructure, uh, in buildings, etc. But EU is out here. We are a mature economy. We already have a lot of railways. We already have a lot of roads. We already have a lot of buildings. Um, and this is a broader context that needs to be taken into account in the competitiveness debate about related to energy and climate because it is simply unrealistic to expect that in the EU uh, the demand levels for steel will reach, uh, again, Indian or, or Chinese levels. Uh, and it's also not likely that the EU will export a lot of steel to Brazil because Brazil has actually major iron ore mines. So it will, in any case, be cheaper to produce the steel in Brazil than they need for the Brazilian market. So I would like to, to here challenge a bit the very simplistic picture that the competitive, this competitiveness debate is only about the price of carbon or the price of electricity. I think the, the key thing that should be uh, faced in the debate is how do actually European industries, and this is the example of the steel industry, but it applies to the cement, uh, to the glass, to, to the chemical industry, how do you as an industry adjust to this new economic situation operating in a, in a mature economy? As the, as the EU. And in Greenpeace, we actually believe that the transition 
to the low carbon economy can actually help industries um, to, to recover. Um, because to continue with the example of the steel industry, instead of uh, fighting very strict climate and energy targets, uh, the steel industry could actually benefit. Um, I'm closing. Um, one wind turbine has the same steel demand as 500 cars, uh, but also other products, uh, for example, cement, uh, glass for the renovation of and insulation of buildings is absolutely crucial and is an opportunity for these industries. But of course, also the industry must transform itself, must look at low carbon methods of steel production. And uh, that's not straightforward. There, we need to have a discussion in the context of 2030 uh, green paper in, in terms of 2030 targets and measures. What can be the role of European industry in delivering on these targets and how can we put in place the financing mechanisms and the measures uh, needed to bring these uh, companies on board? Uh, would of course be interested also to hear the ideas of, of Shell in this, uh, in this regard. So I hope, Greenpeace hopes very much that the 2030 green paper can be the start of a evidence-based open debate uh, and only with such a debate involving all the stakeholders, we can make, of course, uh, climate action for Europe into a success. And hopefully that will also lead to success for the, for the economy. Thank you.